What are the sales and business lessons from Super Bowl 55? We'll be discussing that with John Kalensik on episode 18 of the Pete Primo Show. This show is brought to you by my free Facebook group, Pete Primo Sales and Marketing. Find out more at PetePrimo.com. This week's guest is John Kalensik. John, welcome back. Hi, Pete. How are you doing? Thank you for having me I'm back. Good. And why did we why why did we wait so long? Yeah, you know what? One uh nose guard interviewing another <laughs> nose guard about Super Bowl 55. It couldn't be more appropriate, huh? I tell you what, yeah, it, I think we're coming from it from the same angle, that's for sure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Same perspective, right? Exactly. So listen, um, there were a lot of lessons for business and sales in Super Bowl 55. And, you know, when I was talking to you before the show, I thought you did a very interesting pivot. You kind of looked back at the year and noticed some of the differences in how we um, and football teams approach things differently now. And that might have led uh, to a very lopsided victory that very few people really predicted. So I'm going to no, let I, you just take off on that one, brother. Uh, no, I, I absolutely agree. It's funny, you know, in the, the time of COVID, you know, what are the lessons we learned? So, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the, about the game and, and how it ties together. But you know, the first thing to, to take from this is what, you know, they learned how to do things in a different manner. But on Sundays, they still had to show up and play. They may have had to do Zoom meetings and this kind of stuff. But on Sundays, it still were the basics, the fundamentals that never went away. OK, that never went away. And I think, you know, the one of the biggest messages to take from what we saw on Sunday is that even though we're in this time of COVID and you know, we have to do these Zoom meetings and things are more technology driven, the question we have to ask ourselves is what technology cannot replace? And that's the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing that we do on a daily basis. That about it. So, you know, I've heard a lot of discussion about if Tom Brady is the greatest of all time quarterbacks and uh, arguments on both sides, we're not going to get into any of that. But this is something that kind of hit me hard. Tom Brady might just be the best leader ever in sports. When I heard about the tweets that he sent, uh, first of all, I guess we could talk about, you know, he did his research, he did his intel, he has always been uh, highly regarded for his preparation for games mm -hmm. throughout his entire career, you know, because for, for those of you who don't know sports, you know, Tom Brady was not the number one quarterback in the draft when, when, when he came out of college, not even close. He he was he was the 175th player or 100 something like that in the sixth round he was taken and uh yeah you talk about the preparation one of the you know one of my favorite brady stories and it's a story told by belichick by bill belichick his coach uh former coach of the cleveland browns and then of course now a icon in new england he said that brady makes him a better coach because he's got to do that much more preparation to stay ahead of the curve of Tom Brady because of how much preparation Tom Brady does. And to echo that even further, after, you know, after the game he was doing his pre he was doing his press conference, one of the last things he said was, now we're on the next year. You know, I've got to get start getting prepared and start figuring out what I did wrong and how to get better for next year. And that's just how the the, the guy thinks. And, and you know the you know, one of the one of the first lessons that I'll, I'll you know we'll talk about here is this: the best team didn't necessarily win the Super Bowl, and we were kind of talking about this in the the pre-show run-up. You know, we were saying you know, uh, in in a game, it doesn't matter if you're the the prettiest thing or if you. And, and by the way, speaking of pretty things, okay, 
I hate quarterbacks, just like I know you hate quarterbacks, Pete. My favorite position for a quarterback is on his back, okay, or he's on the ground <laughs> with his face in the ground, mud a little stuff right up here like this, and he's got to pull it out saying, well, somebody blocked this guy already? That's my, you know, that's how I like to see my quarterbacks, okay? But, you know, going, you know, going back to, you know, going back to, you know, what I was saying, the best team probably didn't win the game, but that doesn't matter. But the team that did the best preparation, probably won that game because they did the things that were necessary. They did the film and then they executed correctly because you could do all the prep in the, at the end of the day, but then you got to execute. And, and there's a lot of pieces that go into it. You know, it's one of the, one of the things I always take from my time, uh, I played at Kent state, Pete, you played at Baldwin Wallace. One of the things that I always take from, you know, my coaches was the first thing that we had to do. And I know for some people, this is going to, you know, this is a, a jumping off point because we're going to get into a little bit of weeds about football. But there's a thing they call the six inch step when you're playing. You know, you can't overstep when you're taking that first step into an offensive lineman. You take an overstep and the guy's going to turn you and to do a thing called a pancake where you're down on your back. And it's, you know, one of the things I like about the game of football, you put your hands on another man and you force him to submit to your will. I mean, that's, it's just, and if not, if he knocks you down, then you've got to get up and find a way to do it to him the next time. Well, let's talk about the six inch step. One of the first drills we always did was this six inch step drill where we just, we stood on a line and just took a, a jab step, a jab step, a jab step, just to get used to that. That's how everything starts. And we built off that and we did that same drill every day of practice from the first day in summer when we would report in the first or second week of August all the way through November then when we were finishing up. And it's no different in business. It's about the fundamentals. It's about the foundational aspects of selling. And the first foundational aspect we talked about was the research part, the preparation part, finding out what, you, what you're going to do. Then what is your game plan? What is your game plan? What are you going to do going forward? And, you know, the, the bigger point is, is how are you going to do things? Do you have a, a plan of action? Do you have a idea of what comes next and how are you going to do it? So let's give you an example of a plan of action, okay, for a touch strategy, okay? So in a, in a touch strategy, you know, the first thing you want to do is you want to research. So if I'm going to contact you, Pete, if I want you to become a customer, I'm going to find out everything I can about you. And you know what, you know, a lot of people say, you're going to go on LinkedIn too and, and search his profile. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is no. Why? Because that's going to come up and he's going to see John Kalensic was searching me, not knowing who I am or anything like that. But then immediately he, if he, when he hears my name, John Kalensic was searching me and then I call him, he's going to think I'm a salesperson. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to find out everything I can about you without going on LinkedIn. All right. We'll, we'll talk about that and why we don't do that like that. So there's a lot of other things that you can use to research somebody. It's not just about going on social media. That's a part of it. That's, you know, when I say what technology cannot replace. Social media has its place, but it's not the end all be all. So now you do your research. You find out about Pete Primo. You find out that, you know, he played football at Baldwin Wallace. And for those of you guys who don't know this, Pete was a beast. You know, one time Pete was bench pressing, not squatting, bench pressing like 700 or 800 pounds. I mean, he was monstrously strong. So I'm going to find out all these things about him so I can have a conversation with him when I do decide to talk to him. And now I've got a plan on, I've got this research. Now, how do I implement it? What's my strategy? What's the plays that I'm going to call? All right. So I come up with a touch strategy. Is it a phone? You know, is it an in-person? What am I going to do going forward? All right. And then what's the cadence that's going to happen going from that? For me personally, what I like to go with is first, I, I like the first piece to be a phone touch. And then I'd like to get them on the phone. And if not, I leave a voicemail, obviously. Then at that point, then you start talking about doing LinkedIn and doing a little bit of research. And then you start talking about doing a content touch, something that has nothing to do with you. I'm not going to say what a great sales trainer I am or how many businesses I've, I grew to this amount. I'm going to have something pertinent to Pete Primo that's going to get out to him. And then I'm going to follow up with a phone call. And it's going to sound something like this. It's not going to you know, it's not going to be the typical thing saying, hey, I was just I was just calling. I, I swear when people say I was just I want to stab them with a fork. My phone call is going to sound something more like this. I sent out this piece about Baldwin Wallace. I was wondering what kind of questions you had about the about the piece I sent off to you. Say, oh no, nothing. I loved it, John. Thank you so much. Well, you know, Pete, I thought that what was really interesting is how they talked about uh, uh, Lee Trestle, uh, Jim Trestle's dad, and how they did this and this. Something that I can jump off and I can start to have a conversation with you about, not just 
you know, you're talking about sales right off the bat. And then you always got to have your plan on what's your transition. How do you transition off a of Lee Trestle to get into a sales, you know, a, a sales posture? And that's got to be planned out. People think, oh, I'm just going to shoot from the hip. You know, I'll figure that out once I get on the phone because you never know what he's going to say. No, you don't know. But that's why you have a plan. OK, that's like saying, well, you know, where are you going? You know, I don't know, but I'm going to make good time. You got to know where you're going, because if you know where you're going, then you can make those little sides and go off this way, go off that way. But you got to have that plan. And the, so, the, you know, the, the first two pieces is the, the research. And then what is that plan for that touch strategy? How are we going to get out in front of that, that person for the very first time? Awesome. So what do you make of the text that Brady was sending to his teammates? Did you read any? any of that or hear about that no well there, there's there's two different aspects there's text that he was sending to his teammates and then text that he sent you know after the game to uh, Tyrion matthew that happened uh you know about something that happened during the game what he was doing was it's it's it was i think brilliant it's the same thing that very pertinent and more importantly very the most impactful thing to do today he was sending them short bursts of information and motivation People have a very, very, very short attention span now. They can't, you know, they're not going to sit there and, you know, you know, read a, a, a three page long text or a, 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 a long blog post or something like that. They want something short, sweet and to the point. And Brady understands that and he knows his guys. And that's the same thing that I'm telling you. You've got to know your customers. If you know your customers and you know what to get to them, they get that short burst of exactly what they're looking for. And it has a much bigger impact. And that's the kind of thing that keeps going. And, and it ties into what you were saying, Pete, that he's probably the greatest sports leader. You know, who knows about quarterback, blah, blah, blah. But you, it's hard to argue he's possibly the greatest sports leader of the 20th century in terms of what he's been able to do on a couple of different teams, you know, in a career covering 20 some years. Although for us Cleveland Browns fans, we know Otto Graham has the exact same number of titles in half the number of years as Tom Brady. <laughs> so listen, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that Tom used statistics to back up statements that he made to his teammates. Specifically, mm -hmm. they're soft. They give up too many yards rushing. We need to put our pads on and go after these guys. Mm -hmm. This is a quarterback telling mm -hmm. his people, we need to go after these people physically. And if we do, I think they'll fold. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's a great scene. It's very powerful. Now you, you got to consider the source. So there's a there's a great scene in the in the first Avengers movie, and that was filmed in downtown Cleveland, by the way. The, the big Avengers fight scene. I don't know if you know that or not, Pete. And I was actually down there with my boy on a Saturday watching some of this stuff get filmed. It was some of the coolest stuff ever for somebody who's a geek. And if you guys can see behind me, you can see the. Uh, uh, oh, over this way. I'm sorry. Uh, nope, over that way. Oopsie. Uh, the plastic man and some of the other stuff. I'm a huge comic book guy. Anyways. So there's this one scene in the Avengers where Captain America jumps on a car and there are these like four or five cops around him. And he goes, we need this street blocked off here. And we need a cordon over here. And we need you guys to do this here. And the cop goes, why am I going to listen to you? And then all of a sudden, three aliens jump on the car and he quickly takes them out. Bang, 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 bang. And he turns back to the cop and the cop looks at his guys and, and, his, and he goes, OK, I need you to do this. And you did exactly what Captain America said. My point is, is, you know, Tom comes from a position of authority because he's done it. He's done it over and over and over again. People won't listen to somebody who just sits there and barks. And you know what that's like being in the locker room, right? You know, somebody who's just a barker, you know, there's that they're that yipping dog. Yip. Yep. But you see that big dog that's done it over and over and over in time and back down other dogs. You're going to listen to that. dog, And that's what Tom's done. You just have that feeling with him. If you're on the field that if he's got the ball in his hands in the last couple of minutes, he's going to find a way to win. And you can't you know, you, you can't put a, a price tag on that. Now, how does that translate to what you can do in the sales and marketing world? Well, people respect doers. They respect people who actually produce things. And like you said, he was sending things with statistics, showing them specifics to motivate them. Not just saying, you got to get tougher. Here's where you're, we're lacking here. Here's where we're lacking there. 
And by backing it up with statistics, it meant something to them. And our customers are the same way. They don't want to hear, you know, oh, gosh, we're so good because, you know, we're going to give you added value or we're going to, you know, whatever the, the, the terminology is. They want to see exactly what have you done for somebody else? How have you improved that? What kind of numbers you have that actually show that? And, and everything's different. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what your business is. We all have these statistics that we use, but you've got to incorporate that because the last thing people want to hear is, you know, I'm going to give you the best service. You know that I do a lot of interviewing, Pete. So, you know, one of the first things that I always ask people is I, I ask them, what do you, you know, how do you compare your competition? The number one answer I get is I give the best customer service. Okay. I hear that 95% of the time. That means somewhere out there that there that there there are 95 people that are or you know they're, they're just lying because no nobody can give the best service all the time. You you, you just can't because everybody doesn't give the best service. What can you do demonstrably for that customer to show them what to do? Brady does it because I mean he's got a 20 year history. He can show that, and that's what you got to find out for you going to your customer. What can you show them demonstrably that makes you different than the next person? And I, I, we were talking about a situation again off, off off camera of what I'm dealing with with a customer and they're asking me this. And when I was telling them, I was like, do you guys remember my last engagement with you? How much did sales increase then? Uh, 112%. How many new salesmen did we hire and how are they affecting the, the overall uh, course of the company? Uh, they're the ones responsible for producing that hundred and hundred some percent and then on and on. And I'm like, so why are we even having this discussion? Why, you know, why are we talking about changing the way we did it before when the way we did it actually worked? It's about coming in and having the numbers and doing that. The other side of that is, is if your numbers aren't good and if you, and if you don't have that, well, then you've got to change and, and adapt to the situation. And, you know, that's exactly what you had. I mean, everybody came into this, this game and they thought it was going to be a shootout. Okay. The, the the two bets that, that got blown out of the water was Kansas City losing and <laughs> the score not being over 56 points, okay? Those were the two yep. biggest loser bets. But what they showed was you had to have a different style to beat this football team. And sometimes that's what you've got to do. You've got to have a different style. Like I said, the best football team probably didn't win this game. Just like, you know, in the, in the Miracle on Ice, the best hockey team probably didn't win that game, all right? No. But the best hockey team for that day did and the best football team for that yeah. day. And that's all you got to do at the end of the day is be the best one that day. That's it. Yep. Yep. Hey, guys, uh, for you listeners out there that are watching this on video and you have to jump, this show is available as a podcast on your favorite platform podcast platforms. You'll find links to my show on all the platforms by going to peteprimo.com. You name a platform, I'm on it. Thanks to uh, Billy and Simon at Get Super Serial. And that I'll talk about that in a little bit later in the show. So Brady did something to that was it was a little bit different than what Namath did when the Jets beat the Colts and it was you know he got in their face I mean he got in the opponent's face and he he's we're going to beat you mm -hmm. that's not what Brady did but Brady said to his teammates we're going to win mm -hmm. we're going to win and I have six Super Bowl rings to prove it and <laughs> exactly you know, believe in, you know, a big part of leadership is believing in your people, right? And having mm -hmm. really good expectations for your people, letting them know what those are and providing feedback and consistent feedback. You know, I'm sure that, so for those of you who don't know, because I didn't do a good job of introducing John, John owns his own sales company. He changes, uh, the trajectory of of small businesses and medium sized businesses and even large businesses with his sales approaches. Uh, but one of the things that John kind of got dragged into was the hiring process, which I don't want to go too far in the weeds on this, but it's interesting to me that you got dragged into that. And it actually became a big part of your business at one point. And my question to, to, to you is this, you know, hiring people to me is the ultimate leadership. 
And one of the things that Tom did is he assembled some of his old teammates. He, he brought them, he recruited them and brought them on. And some of them were problem children, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. can only play with Brady. I mean, mm -hmm. so uh, I want to talk about, you know, talent acquisition a little bit. Sure. And well, leadership. The word you're, the, yeah, the word you're searching for is culture. Okay, that's the word you're searching for. You, you're uh, you're all around it. And he was, he was he, created his own culture. Culture, exactly. So you know, Tampa Bay. You know, last year, year without Brady, they weren't terrible. They were nine and seven, and the quarterback they had, Jameis Winston, he threw for over five thousand yards. He had wow. forty. He had forty TDs, but guess how many picks he had? He had like 30 picks. I mean, it was oh. he it was it was incredible. Point of the story is it wasn't like they had absolutely horrendous quarterback play, but they had a different culture. Okay. Brady came in there and he changed it. He changed the culture. And that's really a large part of the hiring process. What is the culture you bring in? Because if you don't have an established culture, or more importantly, a culture that wins in your organization. You can bring in Zig Ziglar and he isn't going to sell crap. It's just not going to happen. And the I always I call it the dig triangle that I always try and establish in a company. The dig triangle are the three pieces that I'm always looking for in a sales or marketing person. Dig stands for drive, intelligent, and guts. All right. First thing, the drive. If they don't, if they're not motivated to get off the couch, I don't care how smart they are and I don't care how brave they are. It doesn't matter if they don't have the drive. Now, if they got the drive, then they've got to be smart because if they've got the drive, I don't want them driving off a cliff. I don't want them driving in the wrong direction. I need them smart. Or as a, an old friend once told me, in, you know, stupidity is a tough workaround. And then finally, if they've got the drive and they're intelligent, then they got to have guts because you get to that point because you're smart, you're driving hard and you're smart. You get to that point, you're like, ah, should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? Sometimes you got to have guts. I took my uh, uh, last weekend, you know, we, is the weekend we usually do the father daughter dance. And uh, we just, first of all, they're not doing them this year, but we decided last year we weren't going to do the dance anymore because Pete, you know what this is like. You go to the father daughter dance, you're there for three minutes, and then the daughter disappears, and you're talking sports and politics with everybody else for the rest of the time. So what I did instead is I took my daughter out. Uh, we, we had a, a date night, all right? First thing we did is we went to this place called On the Rocks, all right? And it's a, a rock climbing place. And if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see she took a video of me going up the going up the, the rock wall. So talking about guts, you know, I'm a, I'm a six foot, 220 pound, you know, middle-aged man crawling up there with a bunch of other little bendy, you know, rubber people that are that are climbing up these rocks. That takes guts to do that, you know what I mean? And then even bigger guts, you have this fall protection thing. Once you get to the top, you're supposed to just push away from the wall and trust that this thing is gonna let you down easy. And it's the same thing though, when you're when you're hiring and then when you're looking for guts, you gotta, you've got, there's times that you've gotta just push yourself off the wall and just say, you know what, it's gonna work. Okay, and if you do, if you can't do that, you know, I, I you know, you might be successful to some to, to some level, but you're never going to be the successful. You know, if you want to talk about one of you know Brady's defining traits, it's guts. You know, he's got guts out the wazoo, taking the chance and doing the thing that's necessary. And it, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but you got to have the other two things too in hiring. You got to have drive and you got to have intelligence. If you're just all guts, then you're throwing the ball and you you got you know you're throwing for thirty picks. Okay, you got to have the intelligence, and that's what happened this year. Brady threw for I think around thirty five hundred yards. He had about forty touchdowns, but only fifteen or so interceptions. Mm -hmm. A huge difference in the two years, and that's what we're talking yeah. about: drive, intelligence, and guts. And that's the culture that you want to build. So he went out and he started finding those people. There's a great commercial, uh, a T-Mobile commercial with uh, Brady and Gronk, and, it's, and uh, Gronk's down on the golf course, and uh, he's he's talking to Brady. He goes, "What are you going to do?" And goes, I don't know, blah blah. And so first they show the conversation as it actually ha or as it as it happened, if it was perfectly clear. But then they showed it how, how it happened because there was a lot of breakup and static because they did, they both didn't have T-Mobile at the time. And it, it's funny because, you know, it, when you watch the commercial on YouTube, it, it's absolutely hilarious because, the, you know, it, you know what comes out is it sounds like Gronk was was uh, not threatening as much as he was. He was provoking saying, oh, you got to come down here. You're soft. You know, you got to get another bubble. And that's what it sounds like instead of that. But it but the you know, the point of the story is, is 
you know, he, you know, he went out and recruited guys like Gronk, who was retired for a year. He went and gets, gets Antonio Brown. People want to be around somebody that they can trust as a leader. And you'll, you'll notice this, the number, the number one reason in businesses why salespeople leave, the number one reason, because they don't trust their manager. Oh, They'll yeah. stay if they trust their manager. You know, if they trust their manager, if they know their manager will take care of them, they don't trust their manager, they will find a way to bolt because the first the first chance that there's an issue, the first chance that there's something that's going to affect their paycheck, they know that they're going to get screwed over. So they got to trust their they got to trust their leader and, and the people trust Tom because of the culture that he said. He brought his he brought his New England culture that he created and then brought it down with him. You know, I, I've said it often. I've said it a thousand times, and I'm not the first person that said it, but I constantly find myself saying, after a business owner has sat there complaining about his or her staff for a half an hour, I just look at them and I say, but you hired them, you trained them, you tolerated them, and now somehow you're acting like you have nothing to do with it. You have everything yep. to do with it. This, this is yep. you, you, we, at the end of the day, you know, I get a lot of compliments on Nick Marcos, my, my right hand guy, my, my, my partner in this business, you attract what you are period. At the end of the day, over time, you show me a company where the salespeople are constantly leaving and I'll show you a sales manager who can't be trusted. It's exactly that simple. Right. And if exactly you're the right. owner and you're the sales manager, you better look in the damn mirror and get, get, have an understanding that, you know, you thought it was really cute that you saved 150 grand in a VP of sales <laughs> salary. Guess mm -hmm. what? It's cost you millions of dollars in sales. You should have hired somebody. If, if you're not capable of doing it, you should have hired somebody who had the, uh, the judgment and the chutzpah and the polish to properly execute that position in your company. And it takes a lot of maturity to be able to understand, you know what? That's mm. not my, you know, I, I like muddling around in this other area and I don't really like dealing with people and, and understand that. But, you know, I mean, I worked for a company where the, the president of the company kept saying he hated salespeople. And I, sooner or later, I, I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making more money for this guy than his number five, his number four, three, and two combined. And he's openly telling everybody he hates salespeople. I'm like, dude, yeah. seriously, you gotta be kidding. Uh, those, those kind of people, it absolutely blows my mind that they actually exist. Uh, it, I mean, it, when I hear somebody you know, talk about how clever they were because they changed the compensation plan and salespeople's commission could be capped. Oh gosh, look at this. And this is how much money we're going to actually save. You don't save money by, by capping commission. You lose money. Okay. And that's no, just one thing. But salespeople it, leave it, with your best customers. That's exactly right. So the, the two, the, and, and, there's, there's, there's go, ahead, go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I, I was going to say, yeah, there's, there's, there's two aphorisms. Now. There's two aphorisms that I live by when it comes to when it comes to this. First, it's by uh, Coach Lou Holtz. Uh, if anybody knows Coach Lou Holtz, coach at Notre Dame, won a national champion there. Uh, he's actually uh, a graduate of Kent State. OK, and I don't know if anybody knows that. And they, you, he's also you know, you see him all the time on the, on the network shows, giving his advice and input. Well, coach has a, a bit of a let's put it this way, a expectorating problem <laughs> he talks he he spits a little bit but he's got this great saying that's possibly the worst thing for a guy like himself uh, and it goes like this it says practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent perfect practice makes permanent now i love coach but i won't stand anywhere near him when he when he spouts that one off okay because <laughs> it's good <laughs> boo, boo, dodging boo. it's like the matrix you know you're, you're neo dodging everything but you know, the first thing is, is if you don't have somebody who can practice perfect with your folks that can show them how to do these things over and over and over again, you're right, find that person. And then the other side of that is, is then once you've got that person, the next line that I, you know, that I absolutely adore in this situation is, you get what you tolerate. Mm -hmm. 
what you're willing to put up with, you will put up with and have to live with. It's as simple as that. It could be a bad salesperson or a bad spouse, but you tolerate you, you know, what you tolerate, you get to live with. So you've got to have both of those pieces. You've got to have that person who can practice what they preach, but do it perfectly because the more you do it, you know, you know, you, you know the, the example coach always used when he's talking about practice doesn't make uh, perfect, it makes permanent. He talks about swinging the golf club because you can swing the golf club 300 times the wrong way. And all you did is, you know, practice the wrong way to swing the golf club 300 times. You've got to learn the right way of doing it. If you've got somebody right. that can show them the right way of doing it, and doing it over and over and over again. And like we started, when we started off this whole thing, I said about the six inch step, the jab step, just doing that that foundational principle that they can do that, great. And the next side of it is, is once you you know got that person who can teach them, once you got that person who can show them the right way of doing things, then you've got to recognize, you've got to hold people to account, okay? Uh, Kevin Stefanski, recent uh, coach of the year in the NFL of our Cleveland Browns, Pete, uh, he said, you know, they established the culture in Cleveland that they want smart, tough, accountable players, smart, tough, accountable. And that's what, it, you know, the, the last piece is you got to be accountable. OK, if you practice, and you're doing all the things right, then you got to hold them to account that they do it on Sundays correctly. Or in your case, you know, in business's case, are they doing it in front of customers? And the only way you can know that is, are you on the floor with them when they're in front of customers? Or are you going out to customers' offices and are you, as their manager, going out to the customers' offices to make, make sure that they're doing the right stuff? I don't give a wit lick for a sales manager that doesn't go on ride-alongs. If they're not spending 50 to 60 percent of their time with, with their salespeople and going out and seeing them with customers, that's not a sales manager. That's a paper pusher. Okay, That's the same yep. guy who's going to come back with that great idea about cutting commission. You know, <laughs> And the reason why he's probably yep. coming up with this idea to cut commission is to save his job. So, you know, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent, and then you get what you tolerate, all right? And you've got to put those two things together within the culture of drive, intelligence, and guts. And that's what I think, you know, I don't, I don't know because I'm not inside his head and I'm not up, down there in Tampa Bay, you know, sorry to say, and, you know, 75 beautiful temperature down there. But I've got to believe that's the kind of culture he's created. You know, he's got these smart, tough, accountable guys that have drive, they're, they're intelligent, and they've got guts. And they're practicing perfect. And because it's Tom Brady, he will not tolerate imperfection. He will not tolerate bad play, which ties into what you're saying with the tweets he was sending out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, I'm going to just take a second because I have to pay the bills. I'm going to read a chapter really quick. It takes two minutes sure. from Sell a Million. And I want your take on this. So it's, it's for those of you who have the book at home, you want to read along. It's on page 63, chapter 41. You want me to what? Having marketing that works and creating a flood of new prospects in your business is worth nothing if you cannot convert them into sales. If you rely on any type of face-to-face -face interaction and you have others working for you in this capacity, it is imperative that you choreograph your sales process. You were talking about that earlier, John. Everything mm -hmm. from the greeting someone receives when they enter your place of business to answering questions, to taking the order, to delivering the product or service should be scripted out and specific language should be used to help the customer in the best way. This does not have to be overly complex or salesy, but as a store owner, it is your responsibility to make sure your prospects and customers are getting the best you can deliver. Getting the best you can deliver. I did that on purpose, guys. Sometimes <laughs> I can be a little harsh. Simply leaving it up to your employees to say the right thing is not the way successful stores are built. Let your salespeople participate in the scripting. Let them have ownership in this process. Your script should evolve over time. Weekly sales meetings where success stories are shared should guide this process. Spend some time looking at your processes and look and write down how and what should be said at various points. Create an employee manual or sales guide and make sure everyone who comes into contact with a prospect or a customer knows what their responsibilities are. 
Quarterly meetings with your sales team should provide an opportunity to modify the script in a structured way. The $64,000 question should be asked, is there a better way to ask this or do this that will get a better result? Sales scripts that salespeople have ownership in can produce outstanding results. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. If you think that you didn't see sales scripts in Super Bowl 55, think again. Think again. Because you did. You saw so much scripted out and you saw a few other things because a lot of times the other team doesn't know their part. Your prospects don't know their part, and that's why scripts become so important because they give you a framework when things go sideways. So anyway, buy the book, sell a million, go to Amazon, or there's a button on PetePrimo.com. Thanks to Simon and Billy. They put that there. Just go to PetePrimo.com, push the button, and get yourself sell a million. But what do you say, John? What do you say? First of all, I say, first I say it sounds like you get some good added value from uh, Simon and Billy. So, but what I say about what you said was exactly right. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Perfect practice. So let's, let's, let's back all the way up. So you talk about scripts, right? The first thing to remember about sales is selling is a perishable skill. If you do not practice it, it goes away. <laughs> if you, if you don't practice it perfectly, it goes away. All right. So let's, you know, let's set that aside. Now, uh, you know, let's tie that together with football. One of the big practices that a lot of coaches do is they script the first 20 to 25 plays, meaning the first 20 to 25 offensive plays they're going to run, they run regardless of the situation. The reason why they do that is they want to see how the team's going to react. The other team, the opposition is going to react to this play, this formation, this, 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 this. And then to your point, then they come up with their, their counter off of that, okay? If I'm gonna run the play like this and then they're gonna rotate like that, then I do this. And that's why you use a script, okay? And it's like you said, it's you start with, the, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, you start with knowing where you wanna go. That way, if things do go right or things do go left, you know where to go back to. Nobody's saying we want pre-programmed robots, but if you think that somebody's just going to come in and naturally know how to do things without having a, a directional guide, you're wrong. And if you hire somebody who says, "Well, I don't like to go with scripts. I just like to I just like to shoot from the shoot from the hip. I just like to you know kind of see what happens." Run, run from that person or yeah. shoo him out of your store. Get you know because you know, that person's not going to do a wit of preparation and he's going to kill you because he's going to say something to the wrong person the wrong way at the wrong time that's going to cost you. A million. He's not going to sell a million. He's going to cost you a million. I promise you. Yep. Yep. For sure. So one of the things that has impressed me over the years, I've heard stories, especially as teammates and as coaches talk about Brady going outside the normal parameter. So you know, in in professional sports, they have a schedule and they have you know, training regiments and, and team practices, team lifting, team stretching, uh, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Film sessions that they have to attend, they're mandatory. But mm -hmm. Tom Brady is really highly regarded by his ex coaches and his ex players as being somebody who was willing to put in extra hours above and beyond what anybody else was doing. And I think part of the reason he was always been like this, I think that, you know, anybody who's good enough and skilled enough to play football at that level and gets drafted lower than he thinks he should is always trying to prove something. I would hope, but it seems that's who Brady is at, at his core. No, um, I, I think I, I think you're right. I think he plays with a chip, you know, and he constantly does. But it's it, it's fascinating because it's it's a very it's a very diametric thing. He plays with the chip, but he still plays within himself. So I'll give you another Brady Belichick story. Um, Brady was talking about a film session he had with Belichick, and 
everybody knows that Tom Brady is not the most mobile of quarterbacks. Okay, he doesn't got he doesn't got the wheels of a Patrick Mahomes. He doesn't got the wheels of a Baker Mayfield. For goodness sakes, well, there's this clip where he's rolling to the right, and Julian Edelman, who happened to go to Kent State University, thank you very much, is running <laughs> wide open across the field. Okay, so Brady is running to to his right. Edelman's open and he's wide open across the field to his left. And it's about a 65, 70 yard throw with Brady on the run. And Belichick says to him, watching the film session, he goes, Tom, you got to make that throw. He's wide open. And Brady said to him, coach, I, I couldn't make that throw if I was standing still because I don't have that kind of arm strength. And Belichick goes, but it's the safest throw. And he goes, no, it's not the safest throw if I don't have the arm strength because it'll come up and it'll be a pick. It'll be a, it'll be a pick. It'll be an interception. So, You've got to you've got to play with a chip on your shoulder, but that's not a license to steal. You know what I mean? You got to play with a chip with on your shoulder, but then you still got to know what your limitations are. And but the, the, the mistake that people make, they think all I do is play with a chip on my shoulder, be angry all the time, and that's where you get those idiots who say stupid stuff and get kicked out of games for you know for personal fouls. And and they're they're morons. You got to play with a control and a discipline and play within yourself to realize that you can only do certain things. Okay, and the it's the person who tries to do too much that winds up making the bad play and winds up losing the game for everybody. And in business, it's the same way. You know, you've got to know, is my best quality, you know, researching the customer and being so prepared that I come in that I wow them like that? Or is my best quality the fact that I know how to take and synthesize that information once I'm in front of a customer? Or is my best quality or is my, you've got to know what works for you. If you do not know what works for you, you can't play with a chip on your shoulder. It's like, you know, it, it's like, you know, you know, you know, giving the wrong person a, a, a hatchet. You know what I mean? You know, you don't know what they're going to chop up. You expect them to chop up wood, but who knows what they're going to do? You've got to sit there and know who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are. And that's one of the great things about him. And then within that, the thing that people forget is within what, you know, you know that chip on your shoulder and what your, you know, what your limitations are, there's a lot of room to play. There's a lot of room to get better. It's the same thing in sales and business. Just because you know you you know you want to make a million, just because you want to you know be the best salesman, however we want to phrase it, and you have certain limitations to what you can do. It might be you know you know skill set might be this, might be that. But when inside of there, all you can do is be the best person you can be inside of there. And I promise you, if you fix your skill set inside of you know that that chip on your shoulder, wanting to be the best, to knowing what your limitations are. And you improve everything else, that's going to get you a lot farther than taking ridiculous choices or, like I say, you know, you know, having the guts but not the intelligence. Okay, you know, we really get the guts without the yeah. intelligence; it doesn't really matter. And that's, you know, yeah. that's what we're talking about. And that's what you know. I think is the inherent genius to Brady along the lines. He, you know, he's got the guts and the intelligence, and to you know, to take you up on your point about how he does the, the, the preparation. So they have these things called OTAs. Okay, which is uh, uh, the, the team activities, okay, that they can do throughout the year. Well, what they learned this year is those team activities didn't matter as much as how the individuals took care of themselves, okay? And you were talking about how he invests a lot of his own money in taking care of himself and eating the right foods and doing the right exercises and all those things to prepare. And you're going to see the uh, NFLPA, the, uh, the the Football League Player Association, they're going to say, listen, do we really need all these practices in March? I mean, <laughs> it, 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 and when we still had a good, pretty good product on the field. And you're going to have yep. more people investing and in taking care of themselves and having personal trainers and doing that. And it's the same thing in business. Just because, you know, if you're an individual salesperson, just because your your sales manager might suck, you're silly if you don't take advantage of finding a coaching or mentoring guru online that you can listen to, that you can take and spend some time with, finding some information and learning and developing yourself and saying, well, you know, my manager doesn't give me that, so maybe I don't need that skill. That's stupid. And the same thing if you're a business owner. You know, well, you, you know, you think I've put all this time in, I've developed this business, I've, you know, I've borrowed money from my relatives and I was able to pay them back. I don't need to listen to anybody else. I can figure this out. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you need somebody from the outside to look at things from a different perspective mm. to say this is how things are. And you know, the, the biggest mistake you can make in business, whether you're a, as a business owner or a salesperson, is to think you have all the answers all the time. I, I always tell my wife, the best thing that she brings to my life is she tells me no and I'm wrong. And 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 I and she write, you know, I, I do a lot of my own copy and writing things. And she used to be an editor. 
And if I told you the number of fights we get into because of how she wants to edit something, <laughs> but at the end of the day, because I'm listening to her and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what she's saying and I'm absorbing it. And I, then I sit down and I look at it and go, oh my gosh. Yeah, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound, yeah, yeah, I got to change. You need mm. that, that somebody can help you with that. Somebody you can coach and mentor you through those things. And I think a lot of people think they can just power their way through. And like yeah. I said, it doesn't matter if you're this, this business owner who, you know, who's done all this stuff to go to the next step. Many times you need that coach. And I don't care if you're that, that salesperson, just because your manager doesn't give you the training doesn't mean you don't need it. You should want to get better. You should have that drive to get better. Cause how else are you going to, how else are you going to sell a million? John, I love when you get riled up, man. Listen, I want to talk. <laughs> Uh, I want to pick up on that, and uh, but I want to talk just for a minute to anybody out there that's thinking about doing a show like this. So let me just take a moment to talk about Get Super Serial, my production team and sponsors of this show. Get Super Serial makes it easy for me to do the show. Years ago, I started my podcast and I did everything. It was a lot of work. The easiest part is showing up and doing the interview. The hard stuff for me was everything else. I have Billy and Simon at Get Super Serial to take care of everything for me. So basically all I do is I show up for the interview. I do, they do everything that you know, either I can't do or I don't want to do. So I, re I record my interview. They handle the tech, the marketing, the publishing. My show turns up on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, MeWe, uh, Telegram, wherever, wherever this thing is going to lead us, John, into new social media. These guys will be on the cutting edge of that, and they'll put my show there. So if you want to start your own show, it's never been easier than with the guys at Get Super Serial. Talk to them about how they can help you start your own show. Book a free call at GetSuperSerial.com. That's Get Super Serial, C-E-R-E-A-L, at SuperSerial.com. Simon and Billy, they do a great job, and you can see their work right now. So years ago, John, um, when I was playing football, I realized when I got to college, I was in trouble <laughs> because I was a strong, quick, aggressive defensive tackle and nose guard in high school. And I just wanted to win. I really had no technique at all. And you, and you talking about the six inch step. Well, I used to lead with a forearm shiver which is, you know, this technique. Well, the technique mm -hmm. they wanted was hands out under the pads, control the offensive lineman, get rid of them. I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> so in my dorm, so in the hallway of the dormitory where I lived, I would get in my four point stance and I would take that first, you know, little step and put my hands on the wall. And I didn't do it 10 times a day. I didn't do it a hundred times a day. I did it thousands of times a day and people thought I was crazy. They thought I was crazy until I was a sophomore starting on varsity. They thought I was crazy until I was an all Amer first team all American in division uh, two and three. And I was only playing for a division three school. And I was still doing it as a senior after I was the most valuable player in the conference. Uh, twice, the only player to ever do that, and the uh, and a two-time first-team All-American for uh, Division Two II and Three. They thought I was crazy because you don't need to do that. Well, I understand why why Tom Brady does the things he does. I I understand why he has a nutrition coach. I understand why he's strength and conditioning coach. This mm -hmm. dude understands that this is what it took to get me there. And this is what it's going to take to keep me here. And I remember the first time I heard a sales coach talk about this sales is a perishable skill thing. I thought he was nuts. It was Paul Castain and mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's a great, great sales coach for B2B sales. And, you know, he talks about, 
you know, when you've had a good block of business for a long time, your prospect and skills, they will start to wane. So he used to make me do stuff with him that I didn't really like. And hmm. guess what? Management changed at one of my companies. I, I was making a lot of money. I was making three times more money than a really good rep, a really good rep. And I quit. I ended up quitting. I gave it a year. And after this, which was a family owned company, they got bought by private equity and it just went to hell in a handbasket fast. And, you know, these guys were doing everything wrong that you could imagine. They were sitting there cheating on specs and they, and they didn't, <laughs> they didn't even hide it. They didn't even hide it. And then they sat there and denied it to my face, which that's why I ended up quitting. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but I, here I was, I was starting all over again. And so I had to sharpen up those perishable skills. So let me ask you this, John, what are you up to new that can help salespeople um, get coached up and, and, and improve their skills? Well, I'm always, you've known me forever. I'm a big believer in simulations. I'm a big believer in practicing. I'm a big believer in doing whatever it takes to get better at my profession. I do it. And that's the same thing I bring to my folks with my sense of whimsy and my passion too. But, you know, it's funny, you know, this year really, you know, just like it made everybody else rethink their business. It made me rethink how I was doing some things too. And I started to realize that there are times that people need help at that time, meaning they're out on the road and that's when they need the help most, meaning they're about to walk into a building and talk to somebody. And maybe that's when they need that little bit of advice, or maybe it's when they come out of that situation and they're going to go to another customer. Maybe the, the first one didn't go so well and they don't want to make the same mistake twice. And that's when they need it. So I fashioned a new piece of a new piece of my company and it's called Selling Boom. And the idea is to give you access to sales coaching in those times of need. Anybody can sit there and schedule like a psychologist. You know, I have you between three o'clock and four o'clock. I have Pete Primo at 4.15 or 5.50. Anybody can do that. But what about when you go into that meeting at one o'clock? OK, and before you go in that meeting, you want to practice for 15 minutes or you you know what maybe the that that potential objection is going to be. And you want somebody to bounce it off and you want some help outside the box. OK, sometimes, you know, you know, you, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I love using that phrase outside the box, you know, or rephrase that. I hated using the phrase outside the box until I realized that the reason why you got to look outside the box is because we don't know what's in the box. OK, and that's what happens a lot of times yeah. in sales. We don't know what's going to be in the box. That's what we got to look outside. My point being is, yeah. you know, you've got those 15 minutes, you know, who can you pick up the phone or who can you can you text to an idea uh, and to find out what I should do in this situation? You say, oh, gosh, well, you should be doing it with your sales manager. OK, well, guess what? Sometimes people want that, like I said, that 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 other view, something coming from another direction to get that idea. Or what if it's, you know, you, you finish that one o'clock meeting, it didn't go the greatest, and you got another meeting at three o'clock, this one finished at 2.15, and you want to sharpen up before you go to that. You want to have that type of response that you can have. And as we know, sales managers may not always be available, but that's what I'm, I'm doing with Selling Boom is I'm incorporating a on-time, real-time aspect for sales training that if you need that that right now responsiveness, pick up the phone, give me a call, and let's go through that for that 15 minutes and get you practiced up. And I'll be launching an app here in the in the in the coming months that's going to do the exact same thing. And so I'm going to have a little bit of both things. I'm going to have it on the app. I'm going to do the live. There's going to be a couple of different things going on, but it's I'm doing it in these what you know it's called the micro modules, okay, or micro learning is a big phrase. The idea is in these short, intense bursts, okay? You know, I'm a pretty intense guy and, you know, most people can only take me for short, intense bursts. So, you know, it'll be these <laughs> short, intense bursts that we're gonna be doing these things, but that's the stuff that sticks with you, right? So you get that thing, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna give you that idea, practice, 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 and then you're gonna send you off in, into your appointment. And then, you you know, when you hear that word, well, I gotta think it over. Oh, that's interesting, Pete. What is exactly you gotta think over? And the guy goes, oh, that's a good point. I don't know. And it's funny, I, you know, 
off camera today, you know, when you said, when you asked me, uh, you know, when I was on the phone and you said, uh, did you close it? And I said, I moved it closer. I got that exact, uh, that was the John, I got to think it over. And I said, what do we got to think over? He goes, that's a good question, John. I don't know what I have to think over. I go, then what are we talking about here? You have, you, hit, you know, let's, let's take care of business. Let's get started today. It, it's just one of those things that I do it because I've done it, you know, literally millions of times, but it, you know, you've got to get to that point where it is like that, where it's just wrote. And some people aren't there yet. And so I give them that chance to do that perfect practice before an appointment, after appointment, or even on the research side of it. I had a, a long session with somebody just the other night where it, it was, matter of fact, it was Saturday night. It was between three o'clock and four o'clock before I went out on her daddy, daddy daughter date. And I was helping him with the research. He goes, John, I just always use LinkedIn. I go, I know, but you gotta, you gotta hold on to that LinkedIn until after you touched them one time, because if they see that you've reached out and, and, and touched them, now you might say, oh gosh, John, that's why you do the LinkedIn plus, the professional, so they only see that it was you know somebody in this industry. Yeah, but they still know they're getting hit and they get a phone call from you and then they can put, put it together. You've got to come up with different ways to find out information about people. And that's what we did. We spent a half an hour to 45 minutes of, of talking and then another half an hour or so actually going out and finding on the Internet. And it was designed just for that person. So, you know, I'm finding these micro learning modules that are designed specifically for Pete Primo or Joe Smith or Mary Jones are much more effective than all the time having a, you know, here's my class on closing. You know, what I mean, that, uh, you know, that response is about 35 percent here and 45 percent. And da, da, da. you know, people want to they want it suited and custom fit for them. Who wants to wear a suit that's not tailored to your body? OK, you know, you want to wear the suit that fits right, hangs right, drapes across that kind of stuff. You don't want to wear that suit that's oversized and baggy and the pants you got to da, 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 da. So we custom fit every training for that situation. And it's called selling boom. That's awesome. I want to go into that a little bit, but I want to do a commercial for me. Are you looking sure. to improve your sales and marketing in your business? Whether you're a sales professional or a business owner, get a weekly coaching session and pep talk from me, a sales professional with 39 years experience. I started on the floor as a retail salesperson. I've been a VP of sales twice. I own my own business and I help dealers every day uh, sell more and make more money and salespeople every day so if you have a sales sticking point turbocharge your ability to find out what the customer really needs close more sales raise your ticket values i'm here to help you get better at what you do sign up at pete primo's weekly playbook go to peteprimo.com slash playbook that's peteprimo.com slash playbook do it now so John, this is what I have to say. Anybody out there who's in sales, that was good, John. Anybody out there that's in sales or owns a business, and if you're not 100% happy with the way your business and or your career is going right this moment, put the pride to the side and reach out to John and I can guarantee you this, I've known him a long time. He can do great things for your business. I want you to do it now. And John, you'll talk to somebody for a half an hour for free, even if it's not a fit and they'll get some yeah. free advice, right? I mean. Exactly. Well, I, I mean, mean it, it, that's the whole idea. I mean, it's, you, I don't know if I'm going to work with every organization. I don't know if I'm going to work with every person. We've got to find out if there's a fit. and when you're having that conversation many times you're going to hear things that you're like gosh i should have used this like what you just said pete i'm going to use that put the pride aside i'm going to start using that line i love that uh so <laughs> whatever I'm, I'm saying put the pride aside but my point being is you're you know we'll talk on the phone we're asking questions the worst thing that's going to happen is i'm going to ask you some questions that's going to make you think it's going to make you think about what you're doing how you're doing it and what you need to go forward if we're a fit fantastic we're not a fit i still if i'm not a fit for you maybe there's somebody else out there that is my, you know, my overall sole purpose is I just want to raise the level of sales because I, I, I'm absolutely apoplectic, apoplectic, apoplectic about how people are saying, well, we can do without salespeople. We're going to start doing stuff, you know, electronically, blah, blah, blah. No, you can't. No, you can't, Mr. Company. So let's raise the bar of all salespeople. And if it's not me that can help you, maybe there's somebody else. But I'll at least ask you those questions to get your mind thinking and turning. 
And the worst case is you're going to hear something and, or think about something in a different way than you ever had before. And you might wind up getting an idea from me, you know, from us spitballing when we're on the phone. And, you know, maybe doing the old Coach Holtz and I'm actually spitballing as, as we're on the, on, on the phone there. I love Coach. I, 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 I've met him many times. He's a great man. So please, Coach Holtz, if you see this, when you, when you check out YouTube, there's no disrespect. I love you. So listen, everybody out there that's listening, I don't care if you're the greatest. Tom Brady might be one. Well, he for sure is in the conversation for the greatest quarterbacks. How you come down on that and what statistics you use and all that, put that aside. Probably one of the greatest athletes to ever lead a team to victory. Probably that in all of sport. But even if he's not, here's a guy drafted in the what? Sixth round? Sixth round. 170 when, seven, something like that. Seven Super yeah. Bowl victories now with seven two different Super teams? Bowls with two different teams. With two different teams. Now, But it took him 20 years. This, it took him 20 years. Otto Graham did it in 10. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> if he needs specialized coaches, so do you. I mean, there is nobody listening to this. I don't care who you are. And I'm going to tell you this, especially when you're the business owner. Do you, do you, I'm, let me tell you a little secret to all you business owners. Everybody's scared of you and no one's telling you the freaking truth. That's your truth. No one will tell you the effing truth. Get that through your thick head. You're not perfect. You're not God's gift to anything. You need a coach. You need somebody to tell you exactly where you could be falling down. And a good coach could do that. So that's my plug. John, What you get the last word, buddy. I think I'm ready to sign out. I think I've gone on my soapbox probably one too many times. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it, let's, let's, let's boil down and kind of, you know, put everything all together here. So it's preparation. It's about having a plan on how to do it. It's about practicing that plan over and over and over again, having the right culture that you're dealing with, okay, and building that culture that you're looking for because you're not going to find a bunch of little U's. You've got to build a culture to find the right kind of people to fit in and plug in. And then finally, it's about being a being a strong enough person and believer in your own personality and in your own skills that you don't feel small by having to reach out for a coach or for a mentor. It takes all of those yeah. things. Even even the yeah. best need a coach, okay? But you got to do all those other things too. Preparation, have a script, practice, have the right culture, and then make sure you you know if you you know if you've got questions, suck it up, swallow your your pride, put your pride aside, and go out and find that coach. And I won't even charge you for that. That's a freebie. You can have that, John. No royalties. I, I, already, I, I already typed it. In, I, already, I already typed it into GoDaddy, so it's done. So it's already been bought. Just so you know. <laughs> so listen, I want to say one thing really, really quick. Um, have I ever told you the story of the headless bencher? No, but this should be interesting. <laughs> it's really good. Okay. So my midlife crisis was powerlifting. I couldn't afford a red convertible, and. Um, I was, you know, at a point in my life between marriages and I had no insurance, even though I could afford it. And I was lifting heavier and heavier weights. And I had just gotten married to Jenny when I tried 600 pounds for the first time. And what happened was, um, something went wrong and it fell on my neck and it bounced and the one side spotter picked up the barbell after it bounced once on my neck and i was hurt but i survived and i was good enough and there was a doctor in, in the meet who allowed me to continue and i secured my uh I had some national record for the total and I think three or four national records that day, but uh, that's not my point. Here's my point. Something went dramatically wrong. My poor 
wife, we had just been married for two or three days. Um, and here we are going off to the hospital. It's a good thing I have hospitalization now, thanks to Jenny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they do the CAT scan and everything and they go, you know, you're a miracle. You're, you're okay. And I said to myself, self, I don't want this to happen again. And so what we, what I decided to do was to hire a bench coach. So I figured out who the best bench coach in the world was. And it was a guy named Bill Crawford. And he came from upstate New York where I grew up. So I drove every two weeks, eight hours, practice, stayed overnight, visited my family, and then drove back. And that's how I got to that 705 bench without ever yeah. dropping another weight. You did, so, well, yeah, you, you did the, you did the coaching hired, thing. And it, go ahead. I hired a specialized coach who, by the way, God bless you, Bill Crawford. I hope you're still alive. I don't even know if you are, but you and Sebastian Burns, who is no longer with us, did a great job with me. And you guys would have had every right. And if you would have asked me for $10,000 at the end of it, I would have gladly given it to you and you would have earned every penny of it. And you never asked me for a dime, even though I offered to pay you many, many times. I would go there and lift for hours on end. And uh, these guys were amazing. They were the best at the bench press. So what I'm saying to you, you own a business. And if you're a salesperson, you do own a business, whether you acknowledge that or not. And the more you acknowledge that, the more successful of a salesperson you'll be. When you own a business, you need coaching. You need sales coaching. You need business coaching. And I needed coaching. I got it. And it made a world of difference in my performance. And I've done that as an athlete. And I've done it you know, as a salesman, uh, Paul Castain coached me for two or three years and it was one of the best things I, I ever did. And Bill Crawford coached me for two or three years. And I guess that's how long I last with coaches, two or three years. Did you ever, did, <laughs> and, you, and you never bounced a, a barbell off your neck again. It's the, uh, no. <laughs> the, I mean, the old saying is, you know, the most costly disruptions happen when something that we take completely for granted stops working. And yeah. that's what happens. You know, that's why you need somebody else there to spot you, to coach you, because we don't know when that one thing's going to happen. We don't know when that sump pump's going to go. We don't know when this, you know, the most costly disruptions happen when that one thing that we take completely for granted stops working. And in sales, it's because we didn't prepare. We're not ready. We don't know exactly what to say in a particular situation. And that's why you need somebody else backing you up. It, it is a, it's a sign of strength to admit that you need help. It's not a sign of weakness. Yep. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, oh, I heard an echo kind of threw me off. I thought Simon was talking to me in my ear. Um, <laughs> John, you've spent an awful lot of time with me today. And I'm looking at this list of things culture, guts, drive, intelligence, fundamental, basics, preparation, leadership, authority, seven Super Bowl wins, accountability, culture, coaching, sales is a perishable skill. Dude, you over-delivered. You over-delivered. Appreciate it. Added you. value. Added value. So people that want to get a hold of you, best way, phone call? Give me a phone call, 216. 347 6729 or my email John K J O H N K at matriximpact.com. Awesome. Thank you, John. Have a great day. Thank you, Pete. Always a pleasure. Thanks.